Good morning. Wow. Good morning, everybody. Come on in, find a chair.
were you I would have given up on me by now I would have labeled me a lost cause Cause I feel just like a lost cause If I were you I would have turned around and walked away I would have labeled me beyond repair Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair but somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who saves. The God who saves. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands. With wide open arms. Tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays. I used to hide every time I thought I let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way, but I'm learning you don't work that way. Cause somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays, the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who my shame can't separate, my guilt can't separate, my past can't separate, I'm yours forever. My sin can't separate, my scars can't separate, my failures can't separate, I'm yours forever. No enemy can separate. No power of hell can take away. Your love for me will never change. I'm yours forever. You're the God who stays. The God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart you're the God who stays the God who stays you're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away you're the God who stands with wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays. Take away the melody. Take away the songs I sing 
Another breath, a grain of sand Passing quickly through your hand I give my life an offering Take it all, take everything Let them see you Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, and where you Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, so teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. 
Sing it out. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, anyone that can say that's me Amen. right do you need Jesus do you depend on Jesus there's nothing wrong with depending on him that's actually where our assurance where our hope completely rests we don't have to depend on the things that we do we don't have to measure up to be perfect it's all by his grace that we are made righteous and that's exactly why we come to worship today we come to seek the face of jesus and we we give him praise in song we look to the word of god to to encourage us to give us strength to guide us and it all points back in that direction to what we find in jesus himself He's a secure foundation where we can, uh, Proverbs speaks about being, uh, uh, the righteous run into that tower. And Jesus is where we find our righteous. And, we can, and that's why we're here to worship him and praise him today. I'm so glad that you've taken time to join us. Glad to come out on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship today. Um, a few couple announcements i want to mention before we get to announcements on the screen um there's a large bag of taters out i'm going to say taters you know out in the out in the foyer and there's plenty of bags so please as you go take some of those there to bless you so um that would be wonderful for you i did want to uh, also say a special thanks carol biederman this last week she is she doesn't like me to point her out but so I'm going to get in trouble now. But she's been working on repainting the ladies' bathroom over here. And it looks beautiful. And so I, I really always appreciate, we appreciate anybody that takes of their time and their efforts. And so many of you have done that in a variety of ways. And so thank you, Carol. And then right sitting next to you, Linda, um, you jumped in and you did some cleaning yesterday. But when I pulled up to the front of the church this morning, I saw a bunch of the leaves that have been blown in by the front door, and I went right away. Linda took care of that. I knew it was her, right, Linda? That was you. You went the extra mile and took care of that, and so thank you very much. Those leaves have been sitting there all winter. They were covered by snow, and the snow was going bye-bye, and they were still there, so thank you so much. It is a wonderful day for us to come and worship Jesus something that we can do we can come and we can be encouraged by each other and we're going to be looking specifically at uh, hebrews chapter 10 this morning and you're going to find the worship team has been zoning in on worship that comes from some of these scriptures so that's very fitting as well and i think you'll be encouraged and uh, uh, appreciate what we see in god's word today i'm going to have um uh, tay and uh leo i think you're going to help this morning with the offering at least that's what they told me earlier. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, I actually asked them. They just volunteer very easily. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, it is a blessing for us to come here today. And Lord, the songs that we sing, may they may be just more than words. May they be worship from our hearts in sincerity and truth lord thanking you for all that you do for us not just your grace but lord 
you provide continued provision for our lives in so many different ways. And Lord, part of what we do is, is we want to learn to be giving back to what you desire and for purposes. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities to be a part of missions. And this morning as we see some uh, information presented about CMA, I pray that this would challenge us. And Lord, may, may we learn to give deep, to realize that other people around the world need to know you, Jesus, to know you as your Savior. And this is just one of the areas that we can uh, focus on. And Lord, we thank you for your incredible blessings. We pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Person, no church, and no organization is capable of reaching the whole world alone. 
but the scriptures make it clear that it is possible for those of us who believe work together in shooting out heaven. And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? Of the many ways EMAC trains political friends who could use to reach out to Baptists and others throughout the United States and around the world. We reach out in service and look for opportunities to let our light shine. We strive to demonstrate and share the unconditional love of Christ. We go to places where others don't or won't go. We reach out to Baptists and others from the hardcore to the weekend writers. We train our members in fervent evangelism. We go, we serve, and we earn the right to speak. Annually, on average, CMA members touch 743,896 lives for Christ, as 9,487 people making a profession of faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. CMA gives 20% of the money raised to Jesus Film Project. Their mission is to provide people with a life-changing encounter with Jesus through film in their native language. To date, the Jesus Film has been translated into more than 1,985 languages and shown in more than 225 countries. Working through Missionary Ventures International, CMA uses 20% of the money raised to provide motorcycles, bicycles, and other forms of transportation to indigenous pastors and evangelists around the world. To date, CMA has placed 7,309 bicycles, 8,347 motorcycles, 59 boats, 40 horses, 2 snowmobiles, 4 horse and buggies, 13 wheelchairs, and 13 camels to pastors working in 108 countries. Think about this. Out of poverty, prisoners like Jesus. This is God's plan. God sent us to do to believe in the good news, share equally in the mission, and share in the transformation. After all, the plan is good. The work is in his heart and soul. But we have grown. of the money to support the work of Open Doors, providing Bibles, Christian training, Christian literature, and life support for persecuted believers in the world's most dangerous and oppressive countries. CMA is one for the Sun has provided more than 3.3 million Bibles distributed in countries like North Korea, Syria, and Iran. Through Run for the Sun, CMA provides the funds necessary to train and support many projects that strengthen the body of Christ facing daily persecution. The Sun is a place where you can invest and know beyond any doubt that you will be participating in something that will result in someone's life being changed. You can touch someone somewhere in the world for Christ, but the choice is yours. On Saturday, May 6, 2023, CMA members across the United States will participate in the 35th Run for the Sun. Will you help us send the message of salvation through Jesus to your neighbor, to your parents, to your sons and daughters, and to the world. Will you support Run for the Sun? I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that Dave talked about on there. Um, the, uh, the, the, this year, or last year, we did over $5.7 million, uh, and that was split 20% for Missionary Ventures, 20% for Open Doors, 20% for the Jesus Film. But So we, we give away 60% of the money that we raise, but it doesn't really say what it does, how it, how it works. Missionary Ventures, Open Doors, and the Jesus Film, they all work together. These guys... Uh, 
a lot of times they get a new pastor that will give them motorcycle or a horse or a bike or camel or whatever. And they'll also give them Bibles to give away, and they'll also give them a Jesus Born uh, backpack that has uh, a, a, a screen, a projector, uh, speakers, and a player. And it's all uh, solar, a solar charge thing. And so instead of just going out and paying about a Bible or handing out a bicycle or whatever, they have this whole package that they have when they go out and, uh, you know, m uh, go to places that just don't vote. Um, but the, the money that we're trying to raise this year is $6.3 million. We want to go over the $6.3 million uh, figure because CMA has been doing this for 35 years. This will be the 35th year. And we have raised over $100,000, million dollars, and uh, given like I said, 60% of that away. If we go over 6.3 this year, the uh, each one of the, our ministry partners will get one and a quarter million. Um, a couple of those, um, the missionaries' entries got one and a quarter million. They figured that would be a, mil a million salvations for them. Open Doors, if they just do half the money to Bibles, that's 140,000 Bibles. Um, the Jesus Dome Project, one of the things that he said was that there's over 1,985 languages, but I checked yesterday and there were over 2,000 speakers. So the money goes out there and it's really, it really impacts a lot of lives. Uh, and it's something that's really easy to to do out on the table out there. We've got a couple of, oh, I went over. We have a couple of papers that say run for the star on them. They're filled out. All you got to do is put your name and your amount on the back of it and leave your money with Lois. Yeah, Lois is somebody will be out there. And um, that's as easy as it is. We'll be doing this this weekend and next weekend. There's a bunch of uh, material out on the table that Lois and I and Dan and Lori use. But if there's something there that you like to look for, ask us and we'll probably help you be able to give you some of that stuff. And if you give us $100 and you fill the paperwork out right, be Lois, uh, we could get a T-shirt with that. How many of you would have take our two-minute questions this week? I guess maybe we need to do that again this time of year. Okay. All right. Let's well, the, the way the two-minute testimony came about is you put your life story down into two minutes. You have 45 seconds of where I was, 45 seconds of how I met Christ, and then uh, another minute with uh, – what what you've done for me and how you're going to use me that way. Um, it came about because a lot of times back in the day you would stop and you'd we'd have ministries that we that we all did, and if you were motorcycle or hospitality or or uh, uh, medical type ministry, you worked on these guys and load the cars and go and give them a band-aid or whatever and say now you can have two minutes of your time. And so you do your two-minute testimony. And when that was done, you'd say, was there anything more that sparked the fire? You know, what can we pray with you? What can we do you to help? That's how the two-minute testimony came about. So I give it back to you, Dan. So again, this week and next week is a good opportunity to give. Towards CMA and that ministry, uh, we do focus quarterly on some missions efforts, and this is this quarter's uh, mission effort. And so we encourage you. For years, several years, so many have been just um, just have benefited this, and this is a great cause. So that gives you a little more introduction. And and uh, the truth is, Sandy's right on hitting the nail on the head. 
we all should learn to be able to present our testimony in a short, concise way, right? We can talk about the weather, we can talk about sports, we can even talk about pil politics, but maybe we should do better at talking about what Jesus has done for us, right? That's something that we can be challenged by. So thank you, Jim, Lois, Dan, and Lori, others that get involved with that. Uh, this morning, uh, we are in, I don't know, week 13 or so of, the, is it thir 16? 15 or 16, I forget. The number doesn't necessarily count, Rocky, you're grinning over there, huh? Um, like, how many more sermons do I have to endeavor here? Well, really, the point is we're going to look at God's Word, and we're going to be doing this through the end of May. And so I believe actually in, in mid-May, Terrell's going to be preaching one of those weeks as well. And so we'll go through Hebrews through the end of May, and then uh, starting June, first Sunday in June, will be to our summer series where we change everything up, and it's more interactive, and really it's something that can be beneficial. So you'll, you'll hear a little more about that ahead. Well, in this GRIT series... Um, I want to point you to some very comforting words which actually have been a staple for Christians dating back clear to the first century, dating back to Hebrews' time and writing. In the previous weeks, we've looked at a variety of details and information, teaching and principles from, from uh, Hebrews, and just recently, last week, we looked at some of the very meticulous details that the Old Testament, Old Covenant sacrificial system involved. Do you remember that? It involved um, prior to Christ and his death and resurrection. In order for sins to be atoned for, there was an entire litany of things that had to be done. We looked at some of the specifics of the temple, if you remember last week, and some of the diagrams, some of the minor, not just the minor, but the major details of measurements and all those different things. Well, that sacrificial system, it's all been made obsolete because of Jesus. I think that's something that you need to learn to understand, that we want to learn to understand from the book of Hebrews. The Old Testament and that system had important principles and practices, but it's actually made obsolete because of what Jesus has done. Now, I don't know about you, but um, there are certain items which are outdated or obsolete, and some of them are easy to let go of. Others, maybe you're one of those individuals where you want to cling on to something that you've had a long time. Anybody in kind of that predicament where you like it and you don't like the change and it's always going to be this way? Well, yeah, barely broken in. Well, I wanted to give you examples, digging into the time vault. This is a, a picture of me in 1987. No, that's, that's not really me, but actually I had pretty curly hair like that. I didn't have glasses. Yeah, pretty close. Yeah, I could see better back then. But the one thing back in the 1980s and prior, you all remember, it, is the good old telephone on a cord. Young people have no clue what it's like, right? Talk about obsolete. How many want to go back to your telephone on a cord? Me. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now, now one thing that is true, these still kind of have a cord on us, don't they? Yes, they do. Boy, I'm seeing lots of hand, head shaking there. What was that? Yes, they can. You'd rather go back. Okay, so next week, get a hold of your phone provider and cancel it all. <laughs> um, some of you re might remember this. Young people have no clue. Internet dial-up. You click the button, and it, somebody want to mimic that noise? Oh, was that obnoxious or what? How many want to go back to that? Probably not. Okay. Um, I think of, this is before my time. I, I remember seeing them a little bit, but A-Track. Because, you know, eight tracks, you know. Now, here's another one that I remember. Go to that one. How many remember having to mess with those cassettes like that? Sticking a pen or a pencil in there. Well, you know, I recall the do days of being a paper boy where I was jamming to my Walkman going down the streets early in the morning in the dark, delivering papers. 
and I was just enjoying myself once in a while. I was chased by dogs, different things, but all of a sudden, you know, you're cruising along, enjoying the music, listening to Petra back in 1985 or something, and all of a sudden, the music gets distorted. You just stop, and you open that little cassette player, and then pop! messes like that and that just made it for a bad day actually i don't want to go back to that i like some of the you know back in the 80s if you talked about streaming services you were like fishing right St what's a streaming service and and someday somebody will be coming around and and days will come where we'll, they'll look back and say streaming service what are you even talking about right so the point here is pretty clear. There are certain items or things that become what? Obsolete. Some we want to hang on to. Some are even collectible. I get that. And you can make a lot of ma money off that, that Kenny Rogers A-track or something. You know, it's possible. It really is. But there are some things that we want to learn to let go of. Um, what is else, something else that's outdated, obsolete? Somebody. What's something that's outdated <laughs> that keyboard soon well yeah <laughs> or when you drive a car off the lot it's not quite obsolete but what's another example of something that's really obsolete pay phones i know yep what was that pagers yeah because we have cell phones they do the same thing and more Blockbusters, yeah. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah, who wants to pull out a road map? <laughs> oh, my. You mean you don't like Siri or whatever telling you what to do? <laughs> oh, yeah, no service, yeah. So maybe a road map is a good thing, you know, yeah. So maybe it's not always obsolete. So those are just different ideas. I think you get the picture. Well, all of that, it helps us to understand this um, in light of the Old Testament covenant versus the New Testament and what we have in Jesus. Jesus has made all of those practices obsolete. And getting back to some of the biblical matters and what's important here is this Old Covenant sacrificial, uh, sacrificial system, it Came, it became obsolete when? At the time of Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus actually, when he walked this earth and when he was teaching, he actually observed some of those very practices. But at the time of his death and resurrection, everything changed. The opening verses of Hebrews 10, we looked at those a little bit last week, they actually... Um, really emphasize this. I want to point you to a few of those verses, verses 1 through 4. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt the guilt that uh, have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an animal, annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see what kind of position we are in today? I came across this Bible scholar. He's someone much smarter than I am. He, he um, presents this statement to help us understand this. Think about this for a moment. When the sun is behind, the shadow is before. When the sun is before, the shadow is behind. So was it in Christ to them of old. The sun was behind, and therefore the law or shadow was before. To us, under grace... The sun is before, and now the ceremonies of the law, these shadows are behind you. They're vanished away. Doesn't that help put that together? 
I had to read that over and over a few times because it shows some depth here. But it demonstrates that uh, something here. It, what is the constant variable? Is it the law? Is it the sin? No, it's Jesus because he is the very son of God. And he is the constant variable. The Old Testament practices, they pointed towards Jesus. Today, the cross of Jesus, we look back to it. And it's all because of him. I want to point you further in our text this morning in chapter 10 of Hebrews, starting in verse 11. And and we're going to look at a couple important uh, principles or thoughts here. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, referring to Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. This is powerful and truthful. This is encouraging. I've titled this message today, Seated on the Job. Seated on the Job. You kind of get the picture there a little bit. Well, the epistle of Hebrews, what does it do? It makes a very sharp contrast between the Jewish priests of old, and Jesus. He's the everlasting high priest. It is only through Jesus that, it was only Jesus that had the right to sit down on the job. To sit down on the job. Why? Simply due to his graceful action of bearing all the sin of the world, the past, the present, and the future, and that is all coupled because of his death and resurrection. Jesus finished his work or his purpose, and it's the greatest act of love for all humanity. In fact, that's the greatest act of love that we come together to worship Jesus, and we sing songs of praise and worship to him because of what he has done. I want to illustrate this concept of sitting down on the job with you just for a brief moment. There are certain occupations that require sitting. Some of you might have those jobs, like maybe office administration. Maybe you're an Uber driver. I don't know if any of you are. None of you are taxi drivers. I haven't seen a yellow cab out here. Um, Some of you might be into computer programming or use a computer a lot. Those are jobs that what? They require sitting down. Well, on the other hand, there are other occupations that do what? They demand continuous physical movement and strength. It doesn't mean that one job's more important than the other. That's not what I'm saying. But someone like a construction worker, they're always on their feet. They're doing things. They're working. Um, There's even people that get paid to do sports, right? Jacob, Noah, would you guys like to get paid to play hockey? I bet you would. You love it. It'd be great. Yes, there's all kinds of these forms of physical labor, and that's what I'm pointing out. Some of it can be uh, delivery services or restaurant services. That's not actually a picture of me carrying things when I worked in the restaurant. That's somebody else that was more talented. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody carry that much. It's pretty impressive, right? Well, you get the point. There are some jobs that require sitting. There are others that require lots of physical movement and so forth. For those that fall into the later type of category, that occupation, you know, if if you're required to, like Caden, you do sheet metal work. It's not sitting down on the job work. Well, you would get frowned upon if you just sat around and did very little, right? You'd probably be in the unemployment line. And somebody that has that kind of job, you can't be slothful. I, again, reflecting back to, to, uh, my 20s, that's before that big curly hair and that long stringy phone cord, or after that. But back then in my 20s, I worked for a roofing company. And it was normal at certain times to take a break, like 10.30 or so, take a break, get a good drink. However, I guarantee you, the boss, he didn't let us slouch at all. There was work to be done. 
There was shingles to be torn off, to be picked up that were on the ground, to be loaded. There was new shingles to be put down. I remember him always saying Mike was his name and time is money. I bet some of you have heard that before. Maybe you've used that. Time is money, right? A lazy employee would be quickly unemployed. And so I learned that work ethic. So I want to point you to just a two points with you today in the form of questions regarding everything here about Jesus and what is brought up from the New Testament and how we can understand it. Uh, the first one in a form of a question, does posture matter? Now, how many of times have you been told your posture manners, matters? Right? S some of you, some of us here have been told to sit up, straighten up, pull up to the table, stand up straight, don't slouch, right? Have you done that? Oh, now, oh, that was very good. They're sitting up nice and straight. Oh, right on cue. Thank you. Oh, my. I wasn't re asking you to really do that. I was just talking about something we've all used or heard. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, if you think about it, the priestly duties under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, they were never-ending duties. Never-ending. The Scripture speaks about that here. There was this extensive amount of sacrificial work that kept them busy most days of the week. Very detailed. These priests, they were constantly on their feet, and their work was never, never done. It's like, you think they ever said, I'm wait I can't, thank God it's Friday? No, some of them still did this on Saturday. But they definitely rested on Sunday. They're pretty good about that. But these, these individuals, these priests, they were constantly at work. Jesus, on the other hand, he took a seated posture. And what does that mean? It reflects completion. It doesn't reflect that he was slothful or that he wasn't doing his work. It means completion. In the early century Jewish culture, they understood the significance of this act, of this language. Priests, there were often times they had discussions with, with Jesus and he challenged them and sometimes they got so upset they even tore their robes. That signified something as well. I mean, not too many of us when we get upset, unless you're WrestleMania or something, tear your clothes, right? But these priests, they would literally tear their robes in defiance because of the claims Jesus made. Let me point you to some, one of them here. Mark chapter 14 records this in this conversation. The priest saying, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witness, he asks. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? These individuals had it out for Jesus. Everything was changing all around them. And this is just one of the many epic battles that Jesus had with a local priest. They despised Jesus because he spoke with authority, yet Jesus didn't come from the proper family lineage line he couldn't be making these claims he was blasphemous but jesus made these claims for a reason to be the one and only high priest forever there are at least 100 over 100 references that speak about jesus sitting at the right hand of god in both the old testament and new that's substantial, wouldn't you agree? Over a hundred of them, where they're prophesied about the Messiah, or whether it's in the New Testament discussion that Jesus had with people, or other teachings throughout the New Testament that speak directly to Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. I think we were singing a song that was related to this out of Romans this morning. We were. If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed, who I- indeed is interceding for us. You see why Jesus' posture matters? He was able to sit down because he completed all those years and accumulations of different sacrifices, hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of animals. And in one moment, it changed history forever because of Jesus. And his posture is noted in Scripture. Here's point number two, and and again, in a form of a question. What's the extent of the coverage? Now, this question, it sounds like as if it could pertain to auto, life, or health insurance, doesn't it? Yeah, I, y- do I sound like somebody calling you out? What's the extent of your coverage today? Right? You love those calls. Well, no, we're talking about what's the extent of Christ's coverage. Think about that. What is the extent of it? Besides posture, we have to understand that even through the Old Testament practices, the priest's sacrificial act, it would... It could never remove sin. The scripture speaks about this over and over through Hebrews. It couldn't remove it. In fact, an animal sacrifice, it was only intended to cover sin. There's a difference. To cover sin. In the Hebrew language, atonement is this word kafor, and it means to cover. When I was doing a little research, and some of you understand some of this in great detail, some of the detail that we can dive into there are in fact five main types of sacrifices under the old testament covenant and they included a litany of steps that were associated with each one of them in different ways but all of those only achieved temporary atonement they would only cover sin for a short time or a day or a year some of these Uh, Different sacrifices include the burnt offering. From when I was reading about this, that occurred twice a day that there was a burnt offering. And there was a whole bunch of stuff that involved with it. Other offerings included what was called the peace offering, a sin offering, a guilt offering, and a grain offering. Sounds kind of elaborate, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of stuff that had to occur for atonement that would never take away sins. So you have Jesus, on the other hand, because of his posture, his completed work, sin is what? Sin is taken away. Let me ask you a question. Which is better for us, folks, to have our sin covered or to have it taken away or removed? Yeah. Now, this is not to say we never sin. That's not what the Bible's teaching here. That's not what I'm presenting to you. Not at all. It's not to say that. Because the truth is, none of us can ever be perfect in this life. There's one. Jesus is the perfect one. What is the principle? The principle is that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. It's fully sufficient, and it's not temporary. Instead of sins just simply being covered through Jesus, our sins are taken away. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as I know, you can't kind of track that, can you? The east to the west. You can just keep going and going. And that's how God thinks of our sin because of what Jesus has done. Thank you, Lord. Amen. The fact that Jesus completed his work, it gives us as Christians our great hope, the greatest hope. And so what we're learning here from Hebrews is just like these Hebrew Christians, here's what's important. You and I can also persevere. We, all, we can learn to persevere in our faith and as our faith develops in our life because what that does, that develops grit and tenacity. It means I'm going to follow Jesus because He is always faithful. He washes my sin away. 
I can rely on him. I don't have to go through certain ritualistic practices for my sin to be covered. I can go directly to Jesus, and he is the once and for all sacrifice. Do you see why we're singing a song like today about our righteousness being found in Jesus? Our confidence rests in him. That's why in this room today, we were singing, Lord, I need you. Right? We depend on him. Lord, I need you. He is our righteousness. I want to close this morning with a few more verses out of chapter 10 with you. They're on the screen as well. One of the songs that the worship team chose, I'll I'll give you this, Lois. We were contacting and and planning this beforehand, so I knew it was coming, so it wasn't a surprise. She wasn't stealing the thunder. Comes right from these verses here in chapter 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, remember that's a reference to the tabernacle, the most holy place, who went into there? Only a high priest once a year. And so we read here, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. How many are looking forward to Jesus coming back? Do you know what? As we are waiting and we're wishing and we're hoping for that, we have something that we should be about doing. We should be, we shouldn't for, um, neglect gathering together, being around other believers, and also we need to be about encouraging each other. We have to remember from the scripture here, it's simple. We can draw near to God because of Jesus. When I think about this on a level that You know, under the Old Testament covenant, they dealt with these peace and sin and guilt offerings. Do we ever wrestle with guilt? Yes, we do. We know that, is it Romans? There's no condemnation, though, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Even though we may sometimes wrestle with guilt, we have to understand, Jesus is the one that we run to. Our sins find their cure in Jesus. I don't have to go and sometimes I wonder if we take ideas or concepts under the Old Testament covenant and we apply them to New Testament living and we think, oh, if I go to church or if I say this or I do this, I can get my guilt taken away. Folks, it's not how it works. We simply trust in Jesus. Our guilt doesn't have to weigh us down. There are times that we wrestle with that, to be honest. I have. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm the only one that's in this position. Because I'm not perfect. God is still working in me, and the Scripture says that we are still being made what? Holy. That means we're not perfect. His perfect work is still perfecting a work in my life. Amen. Each and every day. But if you're one here that struggles with guilt today, I want you to be encouraged by God's word. Because Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, we can boldly, we can simply come to Jesus. Do you realize there's a prodigal in all of us? I'm a prodigal, folks. We are. All have sin and fall short of God's glory. Everyone. However, 
the good news is we can draw near to God unashamedly because Christ's completed work. That is what makes what Christ has done special for all of us. We can draw near to God. And we can do that confidently. We don't have to bear all the burden of the guilt. He bears that. And for that reason, I'm grateful for Jesus. I hope you are as well today. And I pray that you can be challenged and that you can grow in tenacity and grit and perseverance in your life. Because we're never promised roses, folks. We're not promised roses. But we're promised and we know that Jesus is always faithful. I appreciate his faithfulness. I'm a church boy. I grew up hearing and singing that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Isn't it true? His faithfulness is true to this day. And actually, in fact, Hebrews 10 reminds us that he is faithful. So I want to encourage you today. Develop grit and perseverance in your life and in your faith. Keep pressing forward following Jesus. It's worth every moment. It's worth every moment. And do know this. The guilt, that all rests on him and what he's done. Aren't you thankful that you can draw near to God? I am thankful I can draw near to God. It's unlike what the old, old covenant was. One person going into one room once a year. Guess what? We can all do that now because of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, today, we thank you for your word, and your word points us to these important truths. Lord, we thank you that you are seated at the right hand of God. Lord, our righteousness de depends fully on you. And Lord, I pray today that we, like the imagery describing here in Hebrews, is that our guilty consciences can be washed. They can be washed because of what you have done. Lord, we thank you that you provided the once and for all sacrifice. And Lord, I pray that we will take the important message that is here today. And we understand, Jesus, that you are not lazy. You completed a work after centuries, after centuries of sacrifices. You completed it. And Lord, today, that's why we're here. That's why we live each and every day to praise you. We thank you that you sat down on the job. Lord, I pray that we would be people that would find ways to encourage each other right now. We would find ways to encourage and inspire and come alongside others because we know, Jesus, you're coming back someday. And we have some responsibility in this. Might we be an encourager to another. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Go. Draw near to God each and every day. Blessings to you.